Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> We're so excited to see you today with bookshop.org and our two amazing authors. We have Isabel Thomas and Gabrielle Balkan. And we're going to learn so many cool things today. You can do them with the activities if you downloaded them or had the grown up in your house, get them today or the books. Or if you don't have that, that's totally fine too. We're going to have so much fun and learn so much whether or not you have the books or the activities. And there are so many things that I'm sure the grown ups in your house don't even know about science and art that you're going to learn today. You're going to be so so interesting and smart by the end of this. So we are going to talk a little bit really quickly about our authors and then we're gonna go have an awesome time. I'm gonna go away a little bit and then I'll be behind the scenes kind of running some of the questions that you send in and the polling, okay? So let's just talk really quickly. We've got Gabrielle Balkan here, author of Who's Bones Today? That's the one book of many that we're going to be talking about from Fightin. And we also have over in the UK, over in England, we have Isabel Thomas, who is author of Exploring the Elements. Oh my gosh, wow. Both books are so cool and fun and beautiful with so many awesome activities and so much rad art too. So I'm going to go away for a little bit. If you don't have these books, we recommend that you do go to your favorite bookstore and get the books if you can in your town or somewhere online. But if you can't do that with their actual website for the store or you can't do it with the store in person, especially this year, come to bookshop.org, get the books that we're talking about today and the money will still go to directly support your favorite local independent bookstore. If you are the grown up, find that store on our website, bookshop.org, okay? You can find your favorite store on there if for some reason you can't go find it in person in real life. So with that said, I'm gonna go away a little bit behind the scenes. We're gonna have a super fun time with Isabel and Gabrielle learning all about some awesome science facts today. And again, thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you again soon sometime on the other side. All right, you two have an awesome event. Thank you. Bye, Angela. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll just do a quick introduction. Gabe and I are both science writers and we absolutely love curious questions. So we'd like you to think of your best questions during our talk today. And when you think of one, write it in the Q&A box on your screen. And at the end of the talk, we'll do our best to answer them all. Uh, Gabe, Gabe, what are you doing? I'm stretching my phalanges, of course. Your what? My phalanges, the bones in my fingers. You have them too. Why don't you stretch and say it with me? Phalanges. 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 <gasps> Do you, you hear something? Yeah, I hear you saying phalanges. No, no, no. I think there are other people out there. Oh, well, you know what? Angela at Bookshop did say we might have some guests joining us today. I wonder who it is, if it's mostly my parents or if there's some kids. Let's do a poll and find out who's out there. So if there is someone out there, answer the poll that's about to show up on your screen so we know who we're talking to. So what kind of human are you? Are you a human that's three to six years old, seven to 10 years old, or 11 to let's say 111 years old. Or you can answer, I'm not a human, I'm a blue whale. And let's see what yeah. kind of people we have here. <laughs> All right, who is coming through? Um, let's see, Angela, do we have those poll results yet? Oh my gosh, curious. So it looks like we mostly have seven to 10 year olds you know, I thought we would have had more whales out there. Oh, very interesting. We've got 10% whales. We're doing well. <laughs> I do love a whale. Kind of makes me wonder, do whales have phalanges too? Oh, yes, actually they do. See this picture of a whale right here? You'll see it inside my book whose bones illustrated by Sam Brewster. If we could look inside of this whale's flipper, we would see bones inside the flipper that are phalanges just like ours. 
And when you take a closer look, you'll notice that the whale's phalanges look a lot like human phalanges. So believe it or not, we have a lot in common with whales. So everybody out there, I want you to grab something to draw on, like a piece of paper, and something to draw with, like a pen. And as I tell you a little bit about the human hand and these phalanges, I want you to draw a hand as we go along. So in the human body, there are lots and lots of bones. And the places where your body is most flexible is where you have the most bones. And so in the hand, you have 27 bones on each side. And here's an x-ray of the human hand. Now, I would love to see what you've done so far. Even if you're not finished, show me your drawing of the human hand. Ah, Isabel, that looks so good. Look, you're getting the bones in there too. That's awesome. So let me show you how Sam Brewster, the illustrator of this book, drew some hands. And kids, when you're out there, if you want, you can add Q-tips to your drawings to make it look like you did your own x-ray like these kids did here. So I'm gonna read a little bit about Sam and my book. Take a look at these bones. Whose bones? These bones. The Tyrannosaurus Rex had enormous bones. Now, look on your screen and find the house mouse. Does she have bones? Yeah, she sure does. Tiny house mouse bones. Bones can tell you a lot about an animal. Let's look. Whose bones are these? These are human bones like yours. Now let's sign some of these bones. Touch your soft belly or your soft ear. Are those bones? Nope. Now touch your hard rib or your hard scale. Those are bones. Every bone has its own special name and all together they make up your skeleton. Bones sound completely amazing, Gabe. You know what? In my book, Exploring the Elements, I wrote about bones too, about 12 times. Can you guess what bones are made of? Uh, yeah, something really strong, like concrete. Almost. It's actually nature's version of concrete called calcium phosphate. So the two main building blocks of your bones are elements called calcium, and phosphorus. Oh, amazing. Phosphorus, I've heard that before. Isn't that something farmers use to fertilize their garden? Exactly. There's so many weird connections between the elements. In fact, you know, 200 years ago, people used to dig up dinosaur bones, and instead of thinking, wow, and putting them in museums, they ground them up to make fertilizer to help plants grow. Oh, that's amazing. Well, we've got a lot of bones in our body, so that's a lot of phosphorus. Must be. Do you know how many bones we have? Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I wrote a book about bones. I know that adults have 206 bones, but I wonder what those whales and kids out there know about bones. Like, how many bones does a human have in the back of your neck? Let's launch a poll and find out if they know. So kiddos, touch each of the knobs in the back of your bone while I'm giving this. And let's try to guess how many bones are in the back of your neck. Each little knob is a bone. And if you see the pole up there, you'll see some options. But if it's not there, just shout it out. Do you think you have one bone in the back of your neck? Do you think you have seven bones in the back of the neck? Or 50, what do you say? You know, sometimes when I visit a classroom, there's some kid who always says one bone. But if you only had one bone, you would never be able to look over your shoulder and say, oh, hello, or oh, hello. Mm -hmm. So the answer is seven bones. There are seven bones in our neck and that lets us do things like this, which feels so good. So I wonder, what sort of animal has a very different neck from a human neck? Go ahead and shout your answer out. I can't really hear you, but I'm gonna pretend like I am. And maybe Isabel will even shout something out too. Oh, let me think. 
Is it a zebra? Ooh, zebras do have a different <laughs> neck than us, but I was thinking of something more dramatic. Oh, Ruth, did I hear your voice out there? Ruth, my old neighbor in Brooklyn, nice to hear your voice. Well, Ruth got it. She said this animal, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Instead, let's read some clues. And while I'm reading, I want you to draw what you think this animal is. Whose bones are these? I have a very long neck. It's taller than every grown up you know. The bones in my neck are called vertebrae and vertebrae help me look up and down. I live in the African savanna where it is hot, hot, hot. My legs and tongue are long too. I am not an ostrich. Who am I? Kids, shout it out. I can't hear you, but I'm gonna pretend like I can. What? That was a crazy answer. I already said there's no ostrich. One interesting thing about this animal is their tongue is so long, they use it to clean their ears, which even if my tongue was that long, I don't think I would do. So one kind of cool thing about this book is when you open the pages, you can see the answer of the animal right next to its skeleton. And I bet a lot of you got this, a giraffe. I am a Somali giraffe. Long vertebrae in my neck help me reach the leaves at the top of a tree. And I'm the only one who can reach those leaves because my neck is so long. Use your vertebrae to roll your neck around and around and around. Feels good, doesn't it? So now that you've read a little bit about this animal, how many bones do you think are in the giraffe's neck? Go ahead and show me with your fingers whether you think it's one or 10 or 20. And here's another picture of one of Sam's drawings to give you some hints to guess along with it. What do you see? <laughs> I knew someone would say one. There's always a jokester out there that says one. I already told you, if there was only one bone, you couldn't say hello. And the giraffe couldn't move their head up and down around. So you may be surprised to learn that a giraffe has seven bones in her neck just like me and you. In fact, every mammal in the world has seven bones in their neck. So kiddos, put your fingers about an inch apart. That's how big one of your neck vertebrae is. But if you stretch your fingers 10 inches apart, that's the size of a single giraffe vertebrae. So we have the same number of bones, the giraffes is just much larger. And here's a picture of a scientist holding a giraffe vertebrae. Can you believe that? And here's another scientist laying out next to a giraffe. And you can see that the giraffe's neck is taller than her. So those are all the uh, vertebrae that I wanted to talk about with the giraffe. And I'm gonna move on to the next animal. And I want you to draw this one too. So go ahead while I read the clues and we'll guess. And for this one, I'm not even gonna show you the animal's skeleton because I really wanna see if you can test yourself and do really tricky work. So my leg bones are heavy. They are heavier than you. They are strong too. They help me stand for hours and hours, even while I sleep, <sniffs> snore. My body is covered in thick, wrinkly skin. So let's stop there. Let's think about what types of animals have wrinkly skin. Can I hear some of you shout out an animal with wrinkly skin? Ah, I heard someone say, sh Sharpe. Well, here's a Sharpe puppy, and that is really, really wrinkly. But I don't think this Sharpe has leg bones that are heavier than you or me. It's not a Sharpe. Oh my gosh, somebody just said my Nana. Yeah, my Nana has wrinkly skin too. Make your face all wrinkly like these grandparents. Mm, yeah. So my grandma has a wrinkly face, but she doesn't stand while she sleeps, even though she does snore. So we know it's not her. 
Let's take a look at the skeleton and get the big clue. I use my trunk to eat lots and lots of grass. I think that gave it away pretty much. Anyone want to hold their picture up to the screen? What about you, Isabel? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> yes, I love it. I so the wrinkly. <laughs> but I need to like. <laughs> I love it. And here is a wrinkly eye of our mystery animal and a wrinkly elbow. And this is my favorite part of the wrinkly animal, the wrinkly bottom. So I think you know by now, this is an African elephant. And once again, I'll show you the reveal. I am an African bush elephant. I love my body, my swinging tail, my flapping ears, and my powerful legs. These legs help me walk, trot, and swim, but I can't hop. Can you show me? No, I'm serious, show me. I want all of you to start hopping out there to prove that you're not an elephant. All right, <laughs> we finally have proof that Isabel is not a pachyderm. So if we have time at the end, we'll do a few more guessing games. But now I want to introduce you to my good friend, Isabel. But before I do that, I want you to remember to go to the event email and download the activity packet so you can do more animal explorations on your own later on. And that's where you'll also find the certificate that you can print to show that you participated in this event. And this is what that looks like. All right, bye for now. Thank you so much, Kay. That was amazing. You know, I had no idea there were so many clues about animals hidden in their bones. I love a book with secrets. Say, does your book have any secret information inside of it? Oh, well, it does have a few. I'll tell you about it. So my book is called Exploring the Elements, and it's all about the periodic table. Do you know what that is? Oh, no. What is a periodic table? I'll show you. There's a periodic table, so you can see it's a chart. But you don't just have to look inside the book for this one. There's actually a periodic table hidden inside. So if you take the cover off, you can have your very own periodic table to put on your wall, just like I have. And it's a chart that basically lists every single building block of every single thing in the entire universe. And those things are called elements. So could you tell me a little bit about what of these things are in my body? So before I told you about two of the elements and the building blocks of bones, and here are the pages from the book about those elements, phosphorus and calcium. See if you can spot the bones on, this page, on these pages. I made it a bit easier by putting arrows for you. So we've got dinosaur bones, we've got bones from the human hand with those phalanges. So any type of bone would have these two elements in. But it's not just two elements. The book lists all the elements in the entire universe. That's 118 elements in total. So that's 118 pages just like that, telling you all the secrets of everything that ever is. So how many of these are the building blocks of my body? Oh, well, maybe you can have a guess. Do we have another poll? Think about your body. How many elements do you think it takes to build a human? We're pretty complicated. Do you think it's 10? Do you think it's 26? Or could it be 92 elements? Remember, there's 118 all together to choose from. Let's see what you all come up with. I'm going to guess 92. Well, you're getting close. I'll tell you the first answer. 10 elements is all that's needed to make the air that you're breathing in and out. So if you take a big breath in and breathe out, that's 10 different elements being sucked in through your nose and breathed in through your mouth. So we've ruled out 10. And Gabe, you thought 92. Well, 
92, with 92 elements, you could actually build anything that you wanted in the entire universe. I said there's 180 elements overall, but actually only 92 of them are found in nature. The rest are actually only made by humans in um, very complicated laboratories called particle accelerators. So we've got 92 elements, you can make absolutely anything. So that means to make a human, all we need is 26 elements, amazingly. And what's even more amazing is that really most of our body is only made of 11 of those. So I want to set you another question now. We've got 11 elements, which you probably heard of, things like oxygen and carbon and nitrogen. But there's also elements in our body which are much rarer and we only need a teeny tiny little trace of them to make up our bodies. Can you guess which of these they are? Could it be silicon, which is the, actually one of the two main ingredients in sand? Could it be vanadium, which makes toadstools toxic? Or could it be copper, which is the element you find in electrical wires, but it's also the element which makes the blood of an octopus blue instead of red. And some of you might know the element that makes our blood red, which is iron. So I haven't put in that in the list because it's a bit too easy. There is no way that I am toxic. So I'm going to rule that one out and not vote on that. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid to reveal that the answer is all of them, which I was a bit mean there because I didn't give you that as an option in the question, but a lot of people went for copper, absolutely right. We have a lot in common with an octopus. About a third of people went for silicon, so that's what we've got in common with a sandcastle. Silicon does jobs in our body, like kind of structural jobs, so building important parts of our body. But sadly, again, you do have quite a lot in common with a toadstool because we need some vanadium in our diet too. We need to eat some just to top up a tiny bit to do different jobs in our body. Well, I know we always hear that we have to eat so many different foods. So if we eat a rainbow of colors, it means we eat a rainbow of elements too. And we get everything we need to make our bodies work well. I never knew I had so much in common with a toadstool, but I'm going to embrace it. So if I went around collecting each of these 26 elements, could I build a human? Well, you can build things with elements, but it's not that simple, I'm afraid. Mm. So although we say there's only 26 elements in the body, they're not just like 26 elements jumped, dumped in a big pile. They're actually used to make millions and millions of different chemicals, which is what makes our body so complicated. Um, does anyone like building stuff with lego blocks shout out if you do okay do you yeah okay very likes it so if you like building with legos you can make an amazing chemist as well because that's one of the things that chemists do they find out new and exciting ways to combine our elements on 92 or even going up to 118 elements in brand new ways to make brand new amazing things and what I'm showing you at the moment is a structure made of carbon atoms called a buckyball and with 60 carbon atoms you can build these buckyballs and they are incredibly strong so you can make incredibly thin but incredibly strong materials by just combining elements in a new and clever way. It's a bit harder to build living things. Basically, chemists can't actually build a living thing from scratch because the chemicals found in our bodies are the most complicated of all and also the most amazing. And I want to finish off today by showing you just how amazing the chemicals are that even we find in everyday foods in your kitchen. And I'm going to show you a really cool way that you can um, make art using chemicals in your kitchen. And the main ingredient for this art is not going to be paints, it's not going to be paint brushes, it's not going to be pastels, it's going to be a cabbage, a red cabbage. So 
If you want to download the instructions to do this activity, you can find those and you can find a link to download them in your bookshop.org email that they send. So don't worry about doing it right now. I'll show you what to do. And then after the talk today, you can go off, find yourself a cabbage and make some art yourself. So I'm just gonna move my camera down so you can see what I'm doing on the desk. Okay, so. First of all, I chopped up my cabbage to make a nice bowl full of red cabbage. And then you need to get an adult to do this part. You need to pour some hot water over the cabbage and then put it in a safe place until it's completely cool. And as soon as you put it on, you'll see that the water starts to turn blue. And then if you leave it for two hours till it's completely cold, it will have turned dark, dark purple like this. So you've got some amazing cabbage juice. Now, I use the cabbage juice to paint a piece of paper, paint all over the piece of paper, gorgeous purple. And it works best if you choose paper that soaks up water quite well. So art paper is perfect for this because it soaks it up and you get lots of lovely cabbage juice from the painting. But you know, it doesn't look like much of a picture so far, does it? So we need some more paint some more colours. So let me show you what I'm going to use. I'm going to use these guys on this side. Now these look like very boring colours. I'll show you what I've got. We've got some lemon juice, we've got some vinegar, some clear vinegar, we've got some baking soda here. I'm going to add a little bit of water to that just to make it a little bit ready so I can use it like paint and we've got some egg white so you can have any of these kind of everyday foods um anything that you've got to hand or you can try other things in your kitchen too so we've got our purple cabbage paint we've got our kind of boring looking colors but let's see now what happens when we combine them so if I paint my lemon juice onto the, the cabbage paint you can see magically it's becoming bright pink. How on earth did that happen? Let's try something else. I'm going to switch paint brushes so I don't mix them up. Let's try this egg white and see what happens here. I'm going to try this blodge here. Where did that green colour come from? We didn't have any green a minute ago and our green splodges are appearing. I'm going to try another one. I'm going to try the vinegar this time and see what happens with that. Let's put some splodges in the middle here. <gasps> Look at that. Another bright pink. Gay, do you know what vinegar and lemon juice have in common? Because they're both turning the cabbage pink. I make salad dressing out of both vinegar and lemon juice. <laughs> so really good thought. The, the reason you do that is because they're both acids, they're both a bit acidic. So we can already notice a pattern here. The when we're adding vinegar, any, anything that's kind of acidic, it's turning our cabbage juice pink. And when we're adding the egg white or the baking soda, it's turning it bright green or bright blue. And that's what's so amazing about our cabbage juice. I it see that it works as a natural indicator. So the, the chemical is changing color when we're adding either acids or alkalines to it. So you can have amazing fun with your cabbage paint, going around your kitchen, trying out different foods, and finding out if they're acids or alkalines, and making some awesome art at the same time. That is so cool, Isabel. And a couple of our kids today, or maybe she's an adult, Penelope knew it was acid. And I'm seeing finally all these comments coming through. And the people out there today know so much about everything. So let's see, one of our visitors said they wanted to know something about milk. Could you do anything with milk and this cabbage process? I think, I think you should experiment and find out. I'm going to guess that milk is going to be fairly similar to water, which is kind of neutral. It's sort of in between acid and alkaline. So I think it's either going to be blue or purple, but you have a go at home and see what you find out. So interesting. So Isabel, I can't stop thinking about that toadstool thing. Is mm -hmm. there any other poisonous elements that I should know about? 
let me show you. I'm just going to open some up. So one of the most famous poisonous elements is arsenic. You may have heard of arsenic as a deadly poison. And I do talk about that in the book. So at the top here, I've got the arsenic page and you can see that it was once used by mistake in England about 200 years ago to make some sweets because they it used to give a gorgeous green colour to sweets. So they thought, OK, we've well, got this by mistake and actually ended up being incredibly poisonous. But weirdly, there's all kinds of other useful ways that people use it, too. For example, it used to be used in chicken feed. Not anymore, but it used to be. And then it's also used in medicine. So although it's poisonous in a big dose, it can be really helpful in medicine as well for making people better. And there are tons of different information about poisonous elements in the book. So in Exploring the Elements, I tell you about the poison, the elements that make scorpions poisonous. I tell you about a poisonous element that's named after Thor, the god of thunder in, in, in Viking mythology. And I even tell you about an element that can be really poisonous in big doses, but in tiny amounts is super, super healthy and is found in your toothpaste. So there's all these different mysteries to find out. So Isabel, let me ask you a couple of more questions from our participants out there. My favorite one is obviously this. Nathaniel wants to know, what are toadstools? That's such a great question. Toadstools are basically the parts of fungus that we can see. A fungus is not a plant and fungus is not an animal. It's a completely different kind of living thing. And fungi like growing where it's kind of dark and damp and wet. So most of a fungus is found underground, but sometimes you'll see part of it, a mushroom or a toadstool popping up, um, looking really, really bright and colorful. Um, and just kind of going out there to sort of um, release spores so that new fungus can grow in different places. So, and some sometimes toadstool. you'll see an illustration mm -hmm. of a toadstool in a book of fairy tales. They often show them with like a little red cap and they look very pretty but can be very deadly. Can I ask it another question? Not all toadstools are poisonous, but some of them are. So it's best if you see one, look at it, look how beautiful it is, but don't touch, stay away, because there could be poisonous elements inside it. Let me ask you a question now, Gabe. We've got quite a lot of questions about dinosaurs. And I'm thinking, because dinosaurs can only be studied using their bones, that you might know quite a lot. So can dinosaurs run fast, asked Stacey? Well, Stacy, just like with all the animals that are alive today, some can run fast and some can't. Usually the dinosaurs that walk on two legs, we think that they ran pretty fast. And so something like an Ankylosaurus that walked on all four legs, they were sort of slow and tank-like. And that type of dinosaur doesn't need to run that fast because they don't need to catch anything to eat. They're just looking for grass and plants to eat. But an animal that's a carnivore, like a raptor, they are racing after somebody else to eat. So those animals, those dinosaurs could run pretty fast. Amazing. And Jennifer gave a, a good, very good point that they did used to run fast a long time ago, but sadly dinosaurs are no more. And in, the, in Exploring the Elements, I do look at how elements are helping us solve the mystery of what on earth did happen to those dinosaurs. Ooh, I can't, I need to know a little bit more about that because my kids are always asking me. There's a big clue in this picture, can you see? <laughs> <laughs> yep, I recognize that meteor. That's pretty good. Um, we've got some other really interesting questions. Um, Dustin wants to know, what's the difference between gas and natural gas? Is that something that comes up in your book at all? Well, a gas is, yes, I do talk about it a lot because Gas is one of the states of matter. So if we think of anything at all, any chemical, or any element, it can either be solid, liquid or gas. And it can go between the three, depending on how hot and cold it is. But natural gas is a specific mixture of gases. And it's the one that we use to burn as a fuel. So it's basically it's a fossil fuel in gas form. Um, so anything can be a gas. You know, if I get a metal like iron hot enough, I can turn it into 
a gas, a form of iron. But natural gas is made up of um, elements that are, are always um, gases at the sort of normal temperatures we find on Earth. That's a good there, question. Thank you. I like that one too. There are a ton of cabbage questions coming through. We want to know, can this work with a green cabbage? Can it be a cabbage you get at the grocery store? And tell us a little bit about more about the process of making this. If you can use orange juice, if it needs to be dry, just tell us more about all of that. Definitely. Well, you do need something purple. It doesn't have to be a cabbage. You can use red onion skins. You can even use purple flowers and or even try purple carrots or any kinds of pink flowers. But a purple fruit, vegetable or flower will work best because the secret of this is the chemicals called anthocyanins inside, which are what gives it its purple colour. So if you use a green cabbage, it's sadly not going to have those anthocyanins, so it's not going to work as well. But keep a lookout as you go around, even if you're in the garden and you see some nice purple flowers, ask very nicely to the owner and you might be able to pick them and then get your pet parent or your guardian to pour on the hot water and leave it for two hours to cool down and then you'll end up with that brilliant purple paint and then you can just start testing things in your kitchen so yep Gabby asked if anything like an orange would work well absolutely would all citrus fruits grapefruits and limes they're all acidic and um, they're different amounts of acidic and alkaline. And we use a scale called the pH scale to see how it is, how much of an acid something is, how much of an alkaline something is. So if, as you experiment in your kitchen, you'll be able to tell by the color that the cabbage turns. You probably see from here now, my colors are going super bright. So the more alkaline a food is, the more it's going to turn it kind of, you know, bright sort of yellow, green, blue. And the more acidic, the sort of deeper red and pink it's going to go. So it's so much fun to experiment and you get to create your own amazing artwork as well. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. I had no idea that it would turn out so neon. No, it's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm trying to see what are these other questions that might be interesting. Oh, I found a whole batch of dinosaur questions. Um, do you happen to know what's the smallest dinosaur? Because we talk a lot about things like T-Rexes. I don't remember off the top of my head which one is the smallest, but there were dinosaurs that were about the size of a pigeon. And those, so what? that would be sort of this big. And they were very small raptors. And so they were kind of like a pigeon, kind of like a chicken, and they would chase after other animals and try to eat them. So they would probably eat insects and maybe some small mammals, like a mouse type of thing. That's very cool. And so you, earlier you were saying all mammals had seven bones in their neck, but even a mouse, because surely it's too tiny to fit them all in. That's one of the things that makes a mammal a mammal, is mammals have seven vertebrae in their neck, except for two mammals. There are two outliers that don't even stay consistent within their own world. And I'm kind of looking at the Q&A here. I want to see if anyone has a guess as to what two mammals have a different number than seven in their back. Mm -hmm. And someone said a platypus. And so one of them is similar to a platypus because a platypus is such a weird animal. Um, whales have seven, bats have seven. Um, oh, there are so many good guesses coming through here. <laughs> so the answer is a sloth. Oh, a so kidna, there are, a kidna, that's great. Yeah, so sloths sometimes have eight, sometimes have nine. And uh, the other animal is a manatee. And manatees also, it varies how many they have. But if you think about the number of vertebrae in your back, you know, a swan has a lot of vertebrae and most birds have a lot of vertebrae in their neck because they have to be able to move their neck around to kind of clean off their feathers and preen because they don't have hands to use. So they have a really long neck to help them do that. That's very cool. That's a really good question here from Holly. And she said, what are fingernails made of? Are they bone as well? Because they're pretty hard. 
Oh, well, Holly, someone else in the chat answered that question and they said keratin, which is a substance that's pretty firm and you can find it in a ton of animals. It's in giraffes um, and part of the turtle shell is keratin. And uh, it's good because it protects the soft skin underneath it, but it's not so hard that you can't get through it. So it's a really useful substance. That's very cool. <laughs> Someone went back to this question about the toothpaste, um, how toothpaste could be, have arsenic in it. And that's something I want to know. So I'm thinking- Oh, the toothpaste didn't have arsenic in it. It was a different element. Um, think really hard about something that's always printed on toothpaste packets. Can you think of anything? Calcium? <laughs> Fluorine. Fluorine, exactly. So the element that I'm talking about is fluorine. So it's act really, really, really important for our teeth. You absolutely need it to have healthy teeth, which is why it's added to not only toothpaste, but in some countries it's added to the water as well, because it's so important that we have it. But if you have too much, say you were to sit there and, and sort of, you know, eat three, four, five tubs of toothpaste, which no one would ever do, because that would be like a really, really stupid thing to do. That kind of, that would be harmful for you. And that might actually, weirdly enough, harm your teeth. So we, our bodies need exactly the right balance of these elements in like really, really tiny amounts. And if they get that, they're super happy. I just found out, so we moved recently and instead of being on, ha, drinking the city water in New York City, which has fluoride added to it, we now get our water from the well on our property and there's no fluoride in there. So we have to go to our dentist and get a prescription for a fluoride pill to take. So our teeth stay beautiful. You're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone's asked what element is named after Thor? That's actually not as hard as you might think. It's thorium. It's an element called thorium. So you can find out all about that. So Jennifer says that she has a manatee plush, and I'm wondering if she got it when she visited a zoo or some kind of aquarium. And I don't have any stuffed animals that show a skeleton, but I do have a stuffed animal that shows um, the dolphin that got a prosthetic leg or a prosthetic tail. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but the stuffed animal, you can remove um, the tail from the back of it. So I love animal stuffed animals. So yeah, Caroline asked, what does a manatee look like? So a manatee looks a lot like a dolphin or a whale. Um, and they're really common around Florida and the United States and some other places. <laughs> They're very cute. I think. They're so cute. I think they might be the state mammal for Florida. And oh. Aaron says sloth, but they're very slow. So it's true that sloths move very slowly, but how you move doesn't have anything to do really with the number of vertebrae in your neck. So it's unrelated, but it is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. There used to be a sloth um, thousands of years ago that was the size of a small car. It was a giant sloth that had really long nails, just like sloths alive today. It was too big to live in a tree, but it kind of lumbered around South America. And my favorite thing about this sloth is they were so big that they would eat entire avocados, the skin, the pit and all. And then they would walk around and when they relieved themselves, they would poop out the avocado pit. And that's why avocados were able to grow in other places. So if you like guacamole, if you like mm -hmm. avocado toast, you have the giant sloths poop to thank for those two things. Amazing. <laughs> and then, oh, this super question from Penelope. He's asked, how do you pick up elements to make objects? So you remember I was showing you that buckyball made of carbon atoms and you know it's true, we can't just get tweezers and pick up some carbon atoms and start building with them. But what we can do is use other elements to move them around. And basically the, the way we do that is to make laser beams with different amounts of energy. And if you, if you hit um, a cloud of gas or an element with the right kind of energy level laser, 
then you can manipulate the atoms, push them around, get them into the right place and start trying to make different structures. So it's like using some elements as tools to make other elements do what you want them to do. That's really cool. Um, we got another sloth question that I have to go back to. Mm -hmm. Stephanie wants to know why are sloths so slow? And I don't have a good answer to that, but it's good for a sloth to be slow. It helps them live the life that they lead. And so they don't have to eat quite as much because their metabolism is so slow. And you might've heard that some sloths are so still that they actually grow moss on their fur. And so if you were to see a moth in the wild, you would see like plant-like stuff growing on its fur, which is amazing to me. And Stefan has a question about where we are. So I live in New York State in the United States and Isabel. I'm in Cambridge in the UK, so very far away. So for me, it's um, almost eight o'clock at night. So yeah, getting towards my bedtime. <laughs> and I just had lunch, so it's still early in the yeah. day for me. I have a lot left to go. Nicole says laser beams, which I just want to just say that out loud. Yeah, oh, laser beams. There is a. I, I I didn't expect to when I started writing the book, but I ended up writing a lot about laser beams because I didn't realize just how much they're used for. They're so used for you know in building stuff, in industry, in medicine, for dentists, for opticians. There's just no end to what lasers can do. Um. So we have a couple of other people who are English like you. They said hello, oh, yeah. and um. Emma J. Oh, some people want to see your artwork again. Can you show up the cabin artwork again? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to move my camera down. And uh, some of oh, the side, so it's getting a little bit runny now, but you can see. And what doing. would happen if you uh, use some sort of oil on that, like a coconut oil or an olive oil? Yes, I've never really tried that. I, I probably, I'd probably think that oil is going to be fairly neutral because um, when we store food in oil, it's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come out tasting acidic. It, mm. um, I can show you something I can do, you know, if you have, this is basically the cabbage juice on its own. So you can also just um, play with it as an indicator. So I pour the vinegar and you can see it straight away, changes color, turns pink. I might just give it a little more light. Um, I put the lemon juice into that one. Uh, we'll try a bit of oh, egg white in that one. <laughs> um, and then put our baking mm. soda into there. So I don't know how well you can see on the thing, but you can also just play with it as well and use it as indicator to um, very quickly make them change color. Got a nice green turning one there. Um, so it's really, you can just kind of experiment and start keeping a record yourself. And then you're basically being both an artist and a scientist because you're going out there and investigating and exploring yourself. So Jennifer, when she was sharing something she knew about mold, that mold was used in some cheeses, which I remember when I learned that and I was shocked. Do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between mold that's used in cheeses and the mold that you do not want to eat? Oh yeah, you have to, yeah, you, do, you have to hope that there is a difference. There is a difference. So fungus is so helpful for us in, in so many different ways. So mold is like a species of fungus, just like, um, you know, a zebra is a species of animal or a giraffe is a species of animal. So there's all these different types of fungus and each one is just as different from the other as, you know, a giraffe is from a fish. So obviously the ones that we eat, so the mold in cheese, for example, are very, very different and won't harm our bodies. Um, unlike say, if you sit down and munch on a poisonous toaster, which you should never ever do, you know, we don't even want to touch a toaster in case you get some of the poisons on your fingers. So they are all completely different. So you don't have to worry at all. You know, if you've, if you've got a cheese that's supposed to be moldy, that fungus is definitely safe to eat. And um, Yeast is also a type of fungus. And of course we use yeast to make so many different foods, the you know, best known of which is bread. So um, we're really relying on, on fungi for so much of our, in, you know, in our everyday lives. And it, it, they're absolutely fascinating. So um, really, really interesting to find out all about the friendly ones. 
Oh, that's so interesting. I had never thought about there being different species of mold, just as there are different species of giraffe. And when I was in fourth grade, fifth grade, I always thought there was just one type of giraffe or one type of elephant, but there's more than one species with slightly different things. And there's some controversy in the animal world about how many species of giraffe there are. Some people say there's nine species and some people say there's one species with subspecies. So if you really wanna get an animal scientist worked up, start them on that conversation. But each different type of species or subspecies of giraffe has a different color of spot on them. So the Somali giraffe, their spots on their body are one certain shade and one certain pattern around the edge. And other types of giraffes, the, the color is a little orangier and the edges look more like an oak leaf or something like that. And you can look up all the different patterns and try to quiz yourself if you can tell the difference between them. That's amazing. What, what is that hair made of? The hair question, I saw that in one and I was avoiding it because I don't know the answer. Is it keratin also? Is it a type, do you know? I think it, yeah, I think it is keratin. I think it's like the fingernails, isn't it? So it's quite amazing to think that hair and fingernails are made of the same stuff and it's all quite different from bone. And yeah. I once um, I once read that even a rhino's horn is really just kind of hairs glued together. So that's not bone either. It's just like hairs kind of glued together to make this really sort of hard and stiff structure, but it can get worn down just like our fingernails, which I think is really cool. <laughs> yeah, and some animals have to work really hard to sharpen their horn. So there is um, some birds who are birds of prey, they have to keep their beaks sharp so they can then eat a mouse or whatever it is they're gonna eat. So they'll rub their beak along the edge of a stone to keep it sharp, just like a butcher would sharpen their knife in uh, the back of their kitchen. So Jennifer Murphy wants to know how many neck bones are in birds. And the interesting thing about birds is it varies. So you have a different number of neck bones in a flamingo than you would have in a parakeet. And it's a wide variety of bones. And I don't know if animal scientists understand why that is. Um, and I don't think reptiles have the exact same number of bones in their neck. Like I don't know if all lizards have the same bones in their neck. That's something I have to figure out. But a lot of animals have phalanges and like a bat's phalanges look just like a human's except for they're much, much longer. But bats use their hands to push the air behind them and scoop air so they can tumble and do all these really cool acrobatics in the sky. That's very cool. I saw a really good question from James who asked, are there any radioactive elements in the human body? And there are, and the most, the most kind, the main kind of one is potassium and all potassium. Potassium is very important for us. Um, we've had, you know, you hear that you need some salt to keep yourself healthy. And it's not just sodium based salt, it's also potassium salts as well. It's really important for our nervous system to work, um, for lots of other parts of our bodies to work, for messages to be sent in and out of cells. So we need to eat some. And potassium, all potassium is radioactive. And you know, we sort of think, oh, bananas have a lot of potassium in, which means that your bananas are a little bit radioactive. But you know, what I talk about in the book is that not all radioactivity is the same. So a radioactive element or radioactive atom is just one that's breaking apart naturally um, or changing, you know, into a different element over time. And sometimes this happens really, 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 really slowly. So you might wait for a million years and only one atom in your big lump of potassium might change, for example. So not all radioactive elements are equally dangerous, which is a really interesting thing to know because we only hear about the sort of, you know, the bad or the dangerous sides of radioactivity, but actually it's really common and really useful as well. 
So um, Alicia wants to know what our ears and cheeks are made out of. And inside your ear, you know how it gives you, it's not totally soft, but it has a little bit of a bend. That is cartilage. And you'll find mm -hmm. cartilage in your nose too, because it's a little bit firm and it's a little bit bendy. And then also in between some of your bone joints. And it helps sort of pad the bones from grinding against each other. And Alicia, you may know that shark bodies are entirely made of cartilage. And so you can never find a skeleton, not never, but it's very rare to find a skeleton of a shark because other little animals will eat that cartilage because it's not as hard as bone. So you might find shark teeth, but the rest of the body will decompose and go back into the earth, which is great. You reminded me of a very cool thing I read about shark teeth when I was researching exploring the elements, which is that there's a, there's a metal called manganese and there's lumps of manganese found all over the ocean floor. It seems to gather in lumps and like literally form and they could be as big as boulders in some cases. And at the center of most of them is a shark's tooth. So there's something about shark's teeth. You know, sharks produce so many teeth through their life. They never stop producing teeth and they get broken off as they kind of <laughs> tearing into their prey. And then they all drop to the bottom of the floor. And then for some reason, manganese seems to collect around them so much so that that could even be a future source of mining. We could get the metal from those lamps at the bottom of the ocean. Think how many shark teeth will be <laughs> bringing up. So Jack said something really cool. I don't know if you, how do you pronounce this animal, but I think it's pangolin. They're a really cool mammal that looks almost like an armadillo where it has um, sort of like a scale around it. And those are made of keratin. And it took me, I used to think that armadillos were reptiles because they have that sort of hard shell around them, but they're actually mammals. And uh, Dustin wants to know, um, is would a dwarf cat have the same number of neck bones as a normal cat? Or maybe he means just bones in general. I would guess yes. It's the same number of bones, it's just smaller. And so a dwarf cat has shorter leg bones, shorter arm bones, but still has the same type of bone in the kitty cat's body. So it is now three. We can keep going if we want, or are you kids ready to get on with your life? <laughs> um, so a couple of, uh, a, a T, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but someone whose name might be a Tio um, wants to know what a subspecies is. And so I might need Isabel to back me up on this. So you have a species like, um, like a, like a, gosh, now I can't think of a species, like a, like a giraffe. And so the every species of a giraffe that's the same, those two of those giraffes could have offspring together. And so they share a lot of the same features and their bodies are compatible in a way that they could make a baby and continue to reproduce. So cats can make cat babies with other cats, but cats cannot make babies with a dog because they're two different species. So a subspecies, lives within that world of the giraffe, but there's some differences between those animals that make them different. And it might keep them from having offspring together, but I'm not sure. Do you know? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good way to describe it. And often they, they're living in a different place. So yes. you know, it could be a completely different place. So that no, they're very similar, but they're not quite the same. So often you find that there's arguments between scientists about, you know, does this count as different species? Is it a subspecies? Is it completely different? Um, and that's the thing about science, it's always changing. And the, you know, we, we talk about the things we talk about in our books, everything's changing all the time. So there's always new things to discover, and it's all very exciting. Um, and I hope that the two books will really whet your appetite for those areas of science and for finding out more. I'm sort of curious where some of our visitors normally get their books from. You guys could add it to the comments if you want. Do you have a favorite bookstore? Do you go to the library? Do you do online 
ordering. Um, and if you feel like answering that question, we'll answer a few more questions. Um, Penelope is curious about how many teeth sharks have. And mm -hmm. as Isabel was saying, they get more and more teeth throughout their entire life. So humans, we have our baby teeth and then we grow our adult teeth and that's it. But sharks are continually growing new teeth and they just keep on I believe push forward to the front of their mouth so they can keep eating. So in the course of a lifetime, a shark might go through a thousand teeth or even more, a ton of teeth. <laughs> and so you can often find shark teeth because they're just always falling out of the shark's mouth. Yeah. And that's weird. It's not the animal with the most teeth. And it's a really, really hard animal to guess. There is a picture of one. I won't try and find it because there's something like 224 pages in the book, so it'll take me too long. But sea slugs actually have some of the most teeth of any species in their lives. And they also keep producing them. They get ground down because they spend their time crawling across rocks and things and scraping off all of the gunk, which they like to eat. So the teeth go really fast. But in their lives, they can get through 750,000 teeth for each sea slug, which is just amazing. So we shouldn't be so scared of sharks. We should really be looking out for those sea slugs, but they move a lot slower. So they all feel, they feel more friendly, I think. <laughs> Jennifer wants to know how many um, neck bones are in dogs. And because dogs are mammal, mammals, and we know that mammals have seven bones in their neck. You know the answer, Jennifer, it's seven. So no matter if it's a big dog like a St. Bernard or a small dog like a terrier, that dog has seven vertebrae in their neck. They're just different sizes. And uh, here is a vertebrae that I believe belongs to a deer. And we found this this summer when we went swimming in a creek. And uh, this is what the human neck vertebrae looks a lot like to. And so ours are a little bit smaller than this. And uh, deer are one of my favorite animals to think about because their bone, they have bones on their head too, which come in the form of antlers. And that's the fastest growing bone out of all of them. And so deer shed their antlers every year and regrow them. And when they're growing, they are growing so fast, they can grow like half an inch um, now I forgot the span of time, but it's like half an inch a month or something like that. It's in my book. I can check really quickly and let you know. Um, but that is fascinating to me that they grow those bones so quickly. That's amazing, isn't it? Well, there's so much to learn. Um, and I hope that you guys have learned loads today. And we just want to say a massive thank you for joining us. And a huge thank you as well to bookshop.org for hosting us. And I hope that we've kind of inspired you to go and find out more about bones and about the elements in the periodic table. You now you've been with us for an hour, which is amazing. So I think you definitely deserve a certificate and I've got it up on the screen and you can see the kinds of things it talks about what we did today. And we both signed it um, just as a really a big well done for joining us. I found my dear fact. A deer antler grows an inch a day when they are growing it. And so when human babies are growing, they probably grow an inch a year. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. You had so many questions, we couldn't get them to them all, but I love that you asked all these questions. Uh, keep on going and uh, we, you know, maybe we'll cross paths again sometime. Again, thank you to Bookshop and all the indie bookstores out there who support writers like us so we can find out all kinds of interesting information about science. Amazing, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Sorry to say, we gotta go, bye. <laughs>